for a little bit. Um, it's preparing it. Okay. So that is going. So Stephanie, I'll just drop time messages in the chat. Okay. You, but I assume you know the timing anyway. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep track of the time, but it will be helpful, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start the webinar. All right. And we'll wait for just a moment here, folks, while people join us. A stream of people coming in the door. This is faster than the Southwest Airlines lighting, lighting up. The good seats are going. And I'm just going to mute. Okay, we'll just give it about another minute. There's still a big flow of people coming in. Oh, someone just left. Okay, they came into the wrong Zoom room. <laughs> this is the CUNY conference. Okay. I think we should go ahead. So welcome to session nine. I'm Colin Phillips and I am the chair for this session. Um, this is the last session of the first day. Uh, it's the end of the afternoon if you're in US Eastern. It's the post lunch session if you're in the West Coast. It's the best evening entertainment if you're in Europe. And if you're in Asia or Oceania, you are really living the dream. Um, so um, a reminder of the how this will go. So. Um, you, if you want to submit a question, you can use the Q&A uh, box that's in the Zoom tray. And then um, you will be uh, uh, chosen uh, afterwards to present it. If you would like me to read the question for you, then go ahead and indicate that in your question. If you'd like to interact with the speaker, then it's probably best that you ask the question yourself. Um, okay, um, and we're gonna go ahead with the first presentation. And this one is a presentation by Stephanie Rich and Matt Wagers from UC Santa Cruz. And it's about syntactic and semantic parallelism guides filler gap processing in coordination. So Stephanie, take it away. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen now. Looks good. Okay, great, thank you. So just setting everything up. Okay, great. So I will be talking today about uh, the way syntactic and semantic parallelism uh, affects uh, filler gap dependency processing in coordinated structures. And so um, to begin, we'll start by uh, discussing the notion of parallelism. So, uh, and specifically in this case, structural parallelism. So here we see two coordinated phrases uh, that can that contain the same uh, syntactic structure. Um, so here uh, there's a modification and this similar type of modification in the second uh, conjunct as well. And so the effects of parallelism, uh, effects of parallelism in sentence processing are are pervasive. With the general finding being that the the processing of the second uh, conjunct is facilitated if it is parallel to uh, the structure of the first uh, uh, conjunct. So in this case, uh, facilitation here uh, from previous modification compared to a case like this where there's no such previous uh, modification in, in two. Um, and this is found in both coordination and subordination. And it should also be noted that two, the sentences two is not an unacceptable sentence of English. So uh, this processing preference for parallelism is not necessarily a grammatical constraint, but rather something that can just provide facilitation during processing. One instance where this does start to look something like a, a grammatical constraint uh, is the case of the coordinate structure constraint. So here, a constraint that suggests that when you extract something from one phrase, uh, 
you need to uh, extract it as well from the second. So here you can have a sentence like three, they dislike the poetry that the New York Times reviews or publishes, where poetry is, expect is extracted from uh, both coordinated phrases, um, but you can say something like four, they dislike the poetry that the New York Times reviews or publishes interviews, here where you've only extracted from one of the two phrases. Uh, and filler gap dependencies uh, provide a really useful testing ground to look at the effects of parallelism in processing, uh, specifically because the, the processing of filler gap dependencies has been so well studied over the years. So uh, if the coordinate structure constraint uh, gives us this kind of grammatical constraint of where we need to find gaps, uh, uh, theories of active gap filling provide us very detailed uh, predictions of where of how we might expect people to process these two phrases. So, um, so in this case, we would expect two rounds of active gap filling. And what I mean by active gap filling is the following. So if you have, if we were to encounter a sentence like five, my brother wanted to know who Ruth will bring. Um, at some point, the, the, between the, the filler and, and this verb, uh, people have been shown to actively postulate a direct gap, a direct object gap here after the verb. Um, however, if the sentence were to continue, uh, as Ruth will bring us, us home to Christmas, uh, to at Christmas, uh, where instead we see that the correct gap position is a prepositional object gap, instead of the originally postulated direct object gap, uh, overwhelmingly across, across methodologies and, and languages, uh, there's a finding of a filled gap effect where there's a penalty, penalty uh, for encountering material, material in this originally postulated gap site. Um, and so uh, this finding has led to the understanding of the active filler strategy where gap filling is seen as an eager and active process where the parser is immediately postula postulating a gap when possible. Uh, we can ask, however, uh, ca about cases where this um, active eager process might be put on hold, delayed, or where the fill gap effect might be diminished. Um, and so several cases exist, such as um, the fact that active gap filling is sensitive to grammatical constraints where the fill gap effect is not found within syntactic islands, suggesting that active gap filling is, uh, is only going to occur in grammatically licensed positions. Um, uh, other findings suggest that uh, active gap filling is sensitive to argument structure, so you find a diminished filled gap effect if another argument role is available. And other studies find evidence for adaptation across uh, uh, within an experiment where uh, the filled gap effect lessens in severity as participants encounter more prepositional object gaps over the course of the, of the experiment. Um, and so today we're going to be looking at the notion of parallelism and whether parallelism across conjuncts uh, might similarly uh, mitigate the fill gap effect. And so to, just to return for a second to the coordinate structure constraint, um, studies do in fact find two rounds of active gap filling here, um, suggesting a grammatical drive for, for postulating two gaps, one in each coordinated phrase. Um, and so then we can ask separately, is this, is this primarily just a grammatical constraint or, um, or something about a processing general factors such as a, as a preference for parallelism. And so Perker 2017 shows that there's no fill gap effect for parallel NP gap constructions in across the board extraction. So for example, in a, uh, I've tried to condense the stimuli a little bit, but in a sentence like uh, seven, the chemicals which the technician sprayed the equipment with, so a prepositional object gap and prepared the sterile beakers with another prepositional object gap, there's a, a, a very diminished or lack of fill gap effect at the sterile beakers here compared to a, a non-parallel condition where uh, the first gap site is a direct object gap. So the chemicals which the technician sprayed and prepared the sterile beakers with. And so here, prepositional object gap. And so here's where the, um, the filled gap effect arises. And so we can see that parallelism diminishes the filled gap effect in these across the board structures. But, uh, but uh, their later experiment shows that this across the board effect isn't just about parallelism. So in, in comparing the across the board constructions where you see uh, one filler is associated with two gaps um, to non across the board extraction where one filler is associated with this gap and then another filler is associated with the second gap. Um, and so here there is also an effect of parallelism where the, where the uh, fill gap effect is diminished at, at this direct object, but it's not as strong as uh, the 
effect in across the board extraction. Um, so that suggests that across the board extraction is some mixture of a, of, of a grammatical constraint and a, and a preference for parallelism. And so we'll continue to ask about ways where uh, process, uh, parallelism isn't motivated in part by a grammatical constraint. So just to take stock at this point, uh, we've seen that gap filling is an active process that's sensitive to grammatical constraints, uh, making it, uh, and that it's a good uh, testing ground for the role of parallelism in incremental processing. Uh, we've seen that the fill gap effect can be avoided in across the board extraction constructions uh, in, in part perhaps due to parallelism. In this talk, we're going to be asking whether a processing preference for parallelism across conjuncts uh, can diminish the fill gap effect, even if there's no previous gap uh, in the in the prior uh, clause. And so this might be due to some predictive process in which uh, the parser can uh, predictively postpone the, the postulation of a direct object gap or due to some kind of facilitation during reanalysis or having another alternative uh, ready, readily available. Um, we'll also ask how narrowly defined parallelism must be. Um, and we'll explore this in three self-paced reading ex uh, experiments, uh, run during COVID and, and hoped to be uh, replicated in eye tracking once it's possible. Uh, so the first being, uh, uh, a one about uh, a looking at prior syntactic structure where we see syntactic parallelism, a second looking at um, parallelism across thematic roles, and, and a third looking at information structure. And so we'll start by uh, previewing the, the first two experiments going over those designs and the results there, and then I'll continue on to the third experiment after that. Um, and so the, the design of the stimuli across experiments followed this kind of um, structure where you see something like Ben said that Carla ate the dessert, but he wasn't sure what Karen ate the dessert with. And so this sh should be a sort of familiar position at this point where uh, this is a direct object where you might expect to see a gap. And so here's where we would expect a filled gap effect. And this will be our critical region throughout the experiments um, where in fact the, the correct gap position is a prepositional object gap following. Um, and so this minus instrument condition is, is a condition in which there's no instrument uh, mentioned and there's no uh, similar syntactic structure in the first clause. In experiment one, we'll contrast this with a prepositional phrase where an instrument is introduced as a prepositional object. So here we introduce parallelism with the thought being that this is a, a prior uh, prepositional phrase where the instrument is a prepositional object. And here we have then a prepositional phrase with a gap inside. Um, uh, it's possible to note that this does also introduce a, a prior thematic role, um, which we hope to disentangle in experiment two by introducing this instrument, uh, a spoon, but without parallel syntax. So the syntactic structures are different here, um, but, but we've highlighted the same thematic role. And so these will be the two instrument plus instrument conditions across experiments. These will then be, uh, uh, contrasted with a minus gap condition where we see uh, in, in this minus gap condition what is replaced with if. Um, and here there should be no active dependency resolution process. Uh, so, so we'll be looking for the filled gap effect as a, as a contrast between this uh, plus gap condition and minus gap condition. And so these first two experiments are 24 items, uh, again, a two by two crossing uh, plus or minus instrument and plus or minus gap. Um, so just to start off by looking at the first experiment with 84 subjects, um, looking at syntactic parallelism, uh, and and we're going to be uh, zooming in on this and this direct object region uh, just to orient ourselves to the figure. First, uh, we have the minus instrument conditions at the top and the plus instrument conditions at the bottom. And again, we're always going to be looking at the difference between the yellow and the blue to look for the filled gap effect. And so here at dessert, we see a penalty um, for the filled gap effect and overall advantage for the plus instrument condition and a marginal interaction such that the filled gap the filled gap effect comes up most strongly in the minus instrument condition. So this is the condition um, without parallel uh, syntax. Uh, so we see a larger, more persistent filled gap effect uh, with no prior prepositional phrase. You might notice that there seems to be a filled gap effect that occurs before the direct object itself. Um, a regression that includes the prior regions suggests that the effect on the determiner is at least in part a carry over from these previous regions, but that up here that this is a new and emerging effect. Um, so it's true that the baseline effect seems to muddy the effects above, but it doesn't affect the difference at uh, 
dessert. And um, I'm going to pin it, put a pin in this for now, but, um, but we think that this effect might actually have theoretically interesting origins. So we'll come back to this in the discussion. Um, and so to sum up experiment one, we see that a more pronounced field gap effect without prior parallel syntax. Um, however, it's not clear if the field gap effect in the plus instrument condition is eliminated or simply reduced. Uh, a conservative conclusion at this point would be that prior parallel syntax reduces the severity of a field gap effect, um, potentially uh, facilitating the process of reanalysis. Um, in experiment two, we'll look then at whether uh, this effect stems from uh, syntactic parallelism or about some parallelism in, in the presence of, of different thematic roles. So we'll turn to this idea of thematic parallelism, um, where we're using this used a spoon or used an instrument to uh, verb uh, construction in the first clause. And again, zooming in at this, um, at the phrase, eat the dessert uh, in the second clause. Um, and so here we see a marginal fill gap effect um, at the determiner the that arises at both the minus instrument and plus instrument condition. Um, and then here we see uh, what emerges as a significant uh, penalty for the for the gap conditions and a facilitation for the plus instrument conditions. And see, and we see here in pairwise comparisons that that this that this effect seems to be driven by the fact that there's a much larger field gap effect in the minus instrument condition, and there's really no difference in the plus instrument condition here. So what we see is that there's a prior that this. Uh, uh, prior instrument role doesn't eliminate the field gap effect, but it does appear to lessen the penalty. Um, and so we take this as preliminary evidence for a prior instrument mention mitigating the field gap effect without the presence of syntactic identity. It doesn't, of course, discount the idea that syntactic parallelism plays a role by any means, but suggests that on its own, something about introducing the same types of thematic roles can facilitate later processing. Um, I will also note that so far the, the plus instrument and minus instrument conditions have uh, differed uh, in structure and in complexity. So the plus instrument conditions have always been longer and more syntactically uh, complex. Um, and so we wanted to find a way to highlight the instrument in a way that wouldn't result in this, in this uh, uh, structural difference. And to do that, um, We've manipulated the information structure via definiteness to highlight the di direct object and the prepositional object of the first clause differentially. Um, and there are reasons that we might think that information structure should, should play a large role in this after all. So, so we see that the preference for parallelism exists in information structure as well in establishing contrast across conjuncts. Um, in sluicing, uh, sluices tend to resolve uh, more readily to indefinites over definites. And um, some see a pressure to resolve dependencies uh, as, a, as a pressure to resolve dependencies in a discourse uh, prominent position. Um, one case that seems relevant to this is uh, presented by Kashev and Meltzer Osher in 2020, who show that topics can trigger active dependency completion, although the effect is, uh, is uh, weaker than that of um, the like classic field gap effect. So here we have in the WH question, the staff asked which cashier the tall manager forced the new security guard to throw out last week, where, where uh, the new security guard is, um, is classic fill gap effect, a, a, a potential direct object that has been filled, um, where they see a significant fill gap effect here. Um, and then in this other condition that I pulled out, uh, where it introduced the cashier as a topic using this regarding phrase. Uh, so the staff asked regarding the cashier if the tall manager forced the new security guard to throw him out last week. Um, there seems to be a pragmatic motivation to, to refer back to the cashier. And so there's a, a smaller and delayed penalty uh, where you would otherwise find a field gap effect. So all of this together suggesting that um, information structure is something that we should consider in, in thinking about both parallelism and um, failure gap dependencies. And so for the purposes of experiment three, we've done this uh, as, a, as I suggested by manipulating definiteness across clauses. So in a minus instrument condition, having an indefinite with the, with the direct object and a definite with the prepositional object, and uh, in the plus instrument condition, having a, a definite with the direct object and an indefinite with the um, with the prepositional object. And so we've marked the this indefinite condition as a plus instrument condition here as um, 
where the instrument is indefinite, uh, where we believe it may be highlighted for a number of potential reasons, including the tendency for discourse new entities to be introduced with indefinites and the fact that indefinites might trigger the generation of uh, alternatives more so than a definite article. Um, and again, we're gonna be looking at the dessert uh, and looking at the difference between the plus gap and minus gap conditions. And so here we see a penalty for the plus gap condition. So a filled gap effect and a marginal advantage for the plus instrument condition. But here we see that the filled gap effect seems to come out in the plus instrument condition rather than the minus instrument condition. Uh, whereas at dessert, the opposite seems to be true where there's a significant penalty for the plus gap conditions driven by the minus instrument um, condition. Uh, and so, showing that the filled gap effect seems to persist with some timing differences across the instrument conditions. Uh, before trying to uh, uh, say anything real about, about this potential timing dissociation, um, I do want to revisit the items that were used in experiment three as upon further examination. It, it seems that not all direct objects were equally felicitous when definite. So there were some actions that seemed to consume the direct object, which resulted in improbable events when repeated in the second clause. So for example, we had some items uh, like cross the lake where one person can cross the lake in a kayak and another person can cross the same lake in a canoe and that's perfectly felicitous. Whereas other items that involved, for example, verbs of destroying or creating um, where it would be quite strange for one person to break a vase, a specific vase, and then for another person to break the same vase with a different object. Um, and so uh, we hypothesized that, that it was uh, possible that any penalty on the direct object in these and this set of items um, might have resulted instead from, from something about the implausible event structure rather than the direct object uh, filled gap effect. And so just looking at the probable repeated events, uh, we see that a filled gap effect, a significant filled gap effect emerges at the determiner um, and a significant interaction such that there's a larger filled gap effect in the minus instrument condition. Um, so again, the filled gap is never eliminated still, but it seems to be lessened if the prior instrument was indefinite. Um, and again, we see this effect that emerges before the direct object, um, which, uh, um, which is something that we will uh, address in the discussion. And so just to sum up, uh, we see a mitigation of the filled gap effect at the direct object specifically after uh, a previous prepositional phrase, after a highlighted instrument rule, and after a prior instrument that is uh, highlighted in information structure, so perhaps marked discourse new. Um, and given the time course effects and the main effects of the fill gap effect that, that still show up, this suggests that parallelism across conjuncts facilitates reanalysis rather than allowing the uh, parser to predictively postpone a direct object gap. And just in the uh, remaining minute to, to address the effects that occur prior to the critical region, we wondered whether the manipulations that are explored here actually influence the initial expectations about the following clause upon reaching, uh, for example, the filler. So in, in progress, um, we're looking to start a completion study uh, uh, where we ask participants to complete fragments such as the one in 13. Ben said that Carly the dessert with the spoon, but he didn't know what. Because um, we think it's likely that, that other uh, that whatever the most likely conclusions to this might be, uh, might reflect whatever contrast uh, people find to be most natural. So people might actually continue this with something like what kind of dessert or what she used to eat dinner um, that might be uh, informative. And so there are many lines of future work that we are thinking of. So uh, one being to more carefully tease about apart the con contributions of information structure and event structure, the effects of ex explicit prosody on establishing contrast and parallelism, and again, revisiting these initial expectations that might occur at the start of the second clause. Uh, and so thank you so much uh, all for, for listening and I'm uh, excited to hear if there's any questions. Thank you, Stephanie. That was great. Uh, there were a couple of hundred people listening in. Uh, <laughs> so um, we're wait waiting for, so people are typing in their questions into, into the box. Um, and I had a question I was gonna ask you but then you answered it like 30 seconds ago. Um, because oh. you, were talking, you were talking about the completion study. So for much of the uh, presentation, you were talking about it as if the sluices are like other con conjuncts, but sluices are a bit different, aren't they? Because, or maybe, maybe because when you get the, I don't know what, isn't that forcing you to go back and figure out what it is in the first clause 
that might be associated with the un uncertainty? Yeah, so I think there's, there, right, so there's actually like a lot that could be going on here. So just to, um, I suppose like, just to go back to one of the temples, like stimuli. Um, so here it should be like an entirely different contrasted, like what someone else uh, ate the dessert with, but there are like many things that, that could be contrasted. Uh, so like uh, what someone else used to eat, eat the dessert, what someone else used to eat something else, uh, what someone else ate, uh, what what Carla herself uh, perhaps drank. Um, so there are a lot of different potential ways that that um, that the second clause could contrast the, the first clause, and that's why we're very concerned and hope to address this more specifically with a completion study, uh, looking to see what the most um, uh, common or felicitous uh, contrast would actually be in these cases. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're gonna have a question coming in from Roger Levy. Um, so Roger, I think we're gonna be able to unmute you so we can ask- Hello. You. There you are, Roger. Wonderful. Thank you, this is really interesting work. Could you go to slide 41? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, yeah, I wanna understand the the second bullet, the given the time course, the effects and the main effect of a filled gap suggests parallelism across conjunct facilitatory analysis and aligning departure to predictably postpone a DO gap. I, I, th could you unpack that? Uh, I, yeah. Yeah, um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, no, 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 that's exactly perfect. Okay, yeah, so just to, um, I hope these are visible, like the smaller versions of all of the uh, yeah. figures. Uh, but so, so the kind of two possibilities that we uh, considered were one being that, that you could uh, postpone the postulation of a direct object gap if you had enough evidence so that you should see no fill gap effect from the very onset because you never postulated uh, a, a direct object gap to begin with uh, compared to something where you would have uh, postulated direct object gap and then had to uh, uh, reanalyze essentially. And what we find across experiments is that there still is some evidence of a filled gap effect uh, across both conditions, uh, even if it seems to collapse uh, later on as, as happens in experiment two. Um, and so like, I, so the conservative interpretation there is that there is some, some penalty for, for this filled direct object position, um, but that it just seems to be lessened in severity. So that, that was the motivation behind saying that um, this is something that would facilitate reanalysis rather than uh, changing uh, what people have. Uh, but but, but doesn't, doesn't that implicitly presuppose that, um, that, that predictions of presence or absence of a gap are all or nothing across the board uniformly for all participants within that condition? I mean, you could easily have a case where like within a either within a dichotomous, you either make the prediction for a gap there or you don't view, you could say that the probability of making that prediction is being lowered um, by the preceding context um, in the in the difficulty mitigation version, or that predictions are predictions are graded, and we have predict we have quantitative predictions over a whole space of possible continuations, and simply the strength of prediction for that alternative that there would be a gap there is weakened mm -hmm. uh, on the basis of the context. So, like that, it seems like the data would be fully compatible with prediction based theory. As long as that's as long as as long as that's allowed, but it's certainly minimally like even uh, all or nothing. The prediction is there not theory that could vary among individuals or vary across mm -hmm. trials within an individual. Right. Yeah. We should definitely. Uh, I, I haven't prepared like a by participant an analysis, uh, but that would be something to look at. And I think I think these results do or can also lend themselves to an idea where your um, where these manipulations might alter the relative probabilities of, of either a direct object gap or of potential alternatives, like, uh, which, right, which might then decrease the, the amount of direct object gap. I, I mean, maybe your data will, from your continuation study might speak to this as well, because mm -hmm. uh, you might find that within the cases where people are generating continuations that are causal continuations, the, pro the proportion of filled gaps Sorry, the proportion of locations of the gap may well change as a function of the context and weight, and you can see whether that matches the comprehension data or not. 
Yeah, that would be that's a, a really good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Great. I would Thank definitely you. think about that uh, yeah. as we finish up. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really cool work. Great. Uh, and so our next question is from Anissa Neal uh, from UMass. So Anissa, would you like to? Um, are you there? Can you? Yes. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Perfect. Oh. Hi. oh, yes. Perfect. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you so much for this. This was amazing. Um, so just the question that I had was, do you expect um, kind of like lexical parallelism, pa parallelism, sorry, um, in terms of like the prepositions like of versus with or something like that? Or is the idea more that the structural parallelism is like really what's driving the effect? Right. Great question. Uh, the, the idea behind this was that it was something about the structural parallelism. So it was something about having a prior prepositional uh, phrase. So, and, and I mean, I suppose we could say that there, there should be perhaps some low level facilitation from, from just repeated lexical items. Um, uh, but I think it, I think, I think uh, we would predict that this would hold across different prepositions, so long as, as they were assigning perhaps the same thematic role and uh, carry the same syntactic structure. But that's something that, that definitely could be tested and verified experimentally, um, for sure. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Okay, and our last question for this session is coming from Wednesday Bouchon. Uh, Wednesday, uh, can you speak up, un unmute yourself? Yeah, thanks. Um, really interesting work. So I'm curious, I, I just want to hear you say something more about what you think of the baseline sort of shift, right? What do you make of the instrument conditions seeming to push that filled gap effect earlier? And I'm also wondering whether you've tried to pull all your critical regions together and see if that interaction still holds, right? So do you still have a uh, decreased filled gap effect when you look at all your critical regions together? And if you do, like, what's the deal with, with there being a smaller effect, but it being pushed earlier? Okay. Oh, so you mean across experiments? Uh, I, within any of the experiments, really. Um, I mean, I guess it's kind of inconsistent across the experiments, which ones seem to kind of push, push this filled gap effect to the, to the earlier. Right. Yeah. So the, the idea being of like why you might see it earlier in the plus instrument condition is that, um, or at least one idea, one, one possibility, um, and one reason why we were so interested um, in doing a completion study is that, um, is that we thought that it's possible that in introducing another instrument or having, having a construction that specifically highlights another instrument um, introduces like more things that might contrast across the two conjunctions, or sorry, the two clauses, and and um, and so might like it's possible that that earlier uh, effect that arises might be a penalty from not encountering what was expected on the basis of that. So that's something that we want to address as a potential alternate explanation for why there's a penalty uh, here. Um, and then um, I'm not sure I fully answered your question though. No, 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 you totally answered it. I didn't fully <laughs> understand the completion study. So okay. thanks. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you, Stephanie. That's yeah, great. Thank you all so much. And I remind everyone, so there are additional questions that we didn't have time to address. Um, so anyone can go into the, the conference webpage and put stuff in the discussion there if they want to follow up with Stephanie afterwards. Okay, so... Uh, next up, we have um, Matt Lauder from uh, the University of Richmond, who is, uh, his co-authors are Adrian Zhou and Peter Gordon, and he's going to be talking about that thing that you see in the title on the screen. So take it away, Matt. Great. Thanks. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, so... Okay, metonymy is a type of figurative language in which a particular entity is referred to by the name of something that's intimately associated with that entity. And this is a very broad definition, but the reason it's so broad is 
so as to capture the huge range of metonyms that are possible in English and many other languages. So this is a selection of different classes of metonyms that were laid out by Lakoff and Johnson. Um, just to highlight a few of these, we have producer for product metonyms. So he's got a Picasso in his den where the name of the artist is being used here to refer to the works of the artist. Um, down here at the bottom, we have place for institution metonyms, the Kremlin threatened to boycott, where we have a building or other place being used to refer to the institution or the people associated with the institution. So in this case, uh, being used to refer to the members of the Russian government. And so we, we encounter metonymy all the time in normal language comprehension, making it one of the most common examples of figurative language. And yet the processing of metonymy is a relatively understudied topic, especially compared to other types of figurative language like metaphor and idioms. And more importantly, the research that does exist to date presents an unclear picture about how metonymy is processed. And so these questions about the processing of metonymy factor into a much broader debate in the psycholinguistic literature over how we process figurative language. So you can imagine many different types of models that relate to figurative language processing, but at the broadest possible level, we can characterize an indirect access model versus direct access model. So according to a direct access model, sorry, an indirect access model, the semantic relationships of words are composed in a straightforward manner using the literal meanings. In cases like figurative language, a semantic mismatch is detected. And in those cases, additional processing time might be needed. Compared to a direct access model, uh, where the context of the sentence and lexical information would interact immediately, allowing rapid selection of the intended meaning. And uh, under this model, no additional processing would be needed. So in trying to determine which of these models more closely captures the processing of metonymy, we see some inconsistencies in the literature. So one of the first and most well-known studies on the processing of metonymy comes from Frisson and Pickering, where they were studying a familiar place for institution metonyms. So we have college as a familiar place for institution metonym. And the sentence context here can activate either the literal context, the boy stepped inside the college, where we're referring to the literal campus place sense, or it can, uh, we can use the verb phrase was rejected by the college to activate more of a figurative um, institution, the administration of the college sense. And these were compared to unfamiliar metonyms like pyramid, where the boy stepped inside the pyramid is fine because we have a literal sense of what that means, but the boy was rejected by the pyramid is anomalous because we have no familiar figurative context there. So um, in an eye tracking experiment, Frisson and Pickering found robust context by familiarity interactions across the eye tracking record. As you might predict, they, these inter interactions were driven primarily by enhanced difficulty with this bottom condition. The boy was rejected by the pyramid uh, because that doesn't make any sense. But if you uh, take a careful look at their data, in some of their eye tracking measures, there is an indication of greater difficulty for was rejected by the college compared to stepped inside the college, which might suggest some difficulty even with familiar metonyms. Um, the statistical evidence for this was fairly weak compared to what they found for the unfamiliar metonyms, which led them to, uh, to conclude that the, this pattern is broadly consistent with a uh, direct access model. If we take a careful look at Frisson and Pickering's items, we notice that their sentences are variable in terms of what function the critical noun phrase is playing in the sentence. So in some of their items, the critical noun phrase appears as an argument of the verb. So here we have the famous drug smuggler provoked the court or the TV presenter displeased the palace. In other items, the NP appears as part of an adjunct phrase. So we have the boy was rejected by the college or the guards got instructions from the headquarters. And this is important because we know from other work that sentence structure is a powerful cue that marks linguistic focus.
and words that are in linguistic focus by virtue of being an argument of the verb are processed differently from words that are in a defocused sentence position. So this led us to ask the question, do we see different processing patterns from metonyms appearing as arguments versus adjuncts? Um, and so we followed up this question in 2013 with a pair of eye tracking experiments. In the first one, we took Frisson and Pickering's original materials and uh, we, we revised them such that the, the verb phrases always consisted of a single verb. So here we have the journalist photographed the college or the journalist offended the college where we used a single verb that could either elicit the literal context or the literal meaning of the metonym or the more figurative meaning. And the critical noun phrase always appeared as an object of the verb. And we use the same familiar and unfamiliar metonyms as they did. When we look at eye tracking patterns on, here's our target noun phrase, and this is first pass reading time. What we see here is a main effect of context where in both types of metonymy, we're seeing greater difficulty for the verb that evokes the figurative sense compared to the literal sense. So greater difficulty for offended the college than photographed the college. We see no indication of an, of an interaction with familiarity in first pass reading times. In regression path duration on the target noun phrase, the pattern starts to look more like an interaction. That's still not significant. We're seeing a, a main effect of context where people have greater difficulty for the target noun phrase when it appeared in the figurative versus the literal uh, context. But then once we get to the post-target region, so after the target noun phrase, uh, and in some of our later measures as well, we start to see an, an interaction where people are having extended difficulty with offended the pyramid, um, and we're not seeing a, a difference in the familiar metonyms. So in our second experiment, we systematically manipulated the structure of the sentence. Uh, we also dropped the, the weird pyramid case. So we kept the familiar metonyms. We have the college. We compared that to a literal person. So here we have the journalist offended the college or the leader where these are matched for things like length and frequency. And we put these in either an argument context or we put them as part of an adjunct phrase. So we have here honor of the leader or honor of the college. Um, and when we look at regression path duration on the target noun phrase and the post target region, what we see are interactions in both where people are having greater difficulty for offended the college compared to offended the leader. But when the, uh, when the critical noun phrase appears as part of a prepositional phrase, so honor of the college, honor of the leader, we see no differences. So from these two experiments, we concluded that sentence structure has a very important role. When the metonym appeared as an object of the verb, both familiar and unfamiliar metonyms were initially more difficult to process in their figurative versus literal sense. Uh, this pattern is broadly consistent with what would be predicted under an indirect access model, where even a figurative uh, metonym takes a little bit longer to get to that figurative expression. And then the greater difficulty for the unfamiliar metonyms persisted into later measures. However, when the metonym appeared as part of an adjunct phrase, um, in this case, the metonyms in their figurative sense were no more difficult to process than the literal expressions. This pattern is consistent with what might be predicted under a direct access model where there's no processing differences. So this pattern of processing that we reported for metonymy factors into a much larger research program that we've pursued demonstrating that the relative ease or difficulty of processing a complex semantic expression depends critically on the structure of the sentence. So in this panel, uh, this just summarizes what I've explained so far, that we find difficulty with something like offended the college compared to these control conditions, but we show that that difficulty is reduced when the metonym appears in a defocused sentence position We've shown similar patterns with other types of complex semantic expressions. So we've looked in particular at inanimate subject verb integration. So sentences like this, where the subject of the sentence is a tool or some other object that then has to combine with an action verb, the pistol injured the farmer. People have difficulty with that compared to an animate sentence subject, the sheriff injured the farmer. 
or even a force of nature, like the tornado injured the farmer. But that difficulty is reduced when the integration of that inanimate sentence subject and verb occurs across a clause boundary that de-emphasizes the relationship between them. And we've investigated this as it relates to complement coercion. So the, uh, the well-documented phenomenon that people have trouble with a sentence like, the secretary began the memo compared to a control like the secretary wrote the memo or even a passive like the memo was written by the secretary. But when we put the critical noun and the uh, event selecting verb began in separate clauses, uh, difficulty is reduced. So keeping in mind this importance of sentence structure and now returning to the question of metonymy, it's interesting to note that metonyms can appear in sentence subject position without a prior context. Um, so this was investigated by Fishbein and Harris using producer for product metonyms. So we have here Kafka, which can refer to either the literal person or can refer to the works of Kafka. So Kafka was contacted, uh, is meant to evoke the literal sense of the person. Kafka was printed, is meant to evoke the more figurative sense. And across a series of experiments using self-paced reading and eye tracking, Fishbein and Harris showed that people had greater processing difficulty when the metonym was used in its figurative versus its literal sense. And this was even when people got a strongly biasing context that was meant to point people toward the works of Kafka, they still had processing difficulty with Kafka was printed. And so this led Fishbein and Harris to propose a subject as agent principle, according to which comprehenders would provisionally assign an animate sentential subject an agent thematic role. Um, and indeed in their, in their paper, they put animate here in parentheses to emphasize that it's not yet known whether similar phenomena would emerge with other types of metonymy, in particular metonyms that are inanimate. And so this actually draws an interesting contrast between the two types of metonymy. So in these producer for product metonyms, they are literally animate, and figuratively inanimate. Um, in contrast, place for institution metonyms like college are literally inanimate, uh, but they are figuratively animate. And so we uh, constructed a pair of experiments that would address how people process place for institution metonyms when they appear in subject position. So to do this, uh, we have another place for institution metonym here, hospital. So this first sentence is ambiguous. We get the hospital requested. At this point in the sentence, we can either interpret hospital as the agent of the verb in its figurative animate sense, or we could process it as if we're in a reduced relative clause and hospital is the patient of the action. Um, it is disambiguated in the by phrase here when we get by the doctor. And we can compare the processing of sentences like this to an unambiguous control where we have the explicit that was. So we can look for garden path effects essentially um, in the metonym case and compare it to a condition where the sentence subject is an inanimate noun that has no metonymic sense. So equipment requested versus equipment that was requested. And many of you will recognize that this is an adaptation of the classic paradigm designed to investigate effects of animacy on parsing. Um, the idea here is that if comprehenders adopt a subject as agent principle, we should see larger garden path effects in the metonym case compared to the inanimate control. And then we can also investigate uh, what's happening at the beginning of the sentence. When people get hospital requested versus equipment requested, do we observe any initial difficulty at this early portion of the sentence? We did do a corpus study. This is sort of hot off the presses. Um, our 40 place for institution metonyms were drawn from previous literature. They were randomly sampled from the corpus of contemporary American English. Uh, we specifically wanted to know how often they appeared as sentence subjects. That happened pretty rarely, but we took the cases where they did appear as subjects and coded according to whether they were used in their literal or their figurative senses. Um, there was a great deal of variability. Some of them occurred almost exclusively in their literal sense. Others occurred almost exclusively in their figurative sense. But on average, 
uh, literal senses were approximately 45% of the time, figurative were 55% of the time. Um, there was no significant difference across the board in instances of literal versus figurative usage. So um, we took these items and we presented them to participants in an eye tracking during reading experiment. There were 40 experimental items, just like this one, mixed with a bunch of fillers, counterbalanced. The metonyms and the inanimate controls did not differ in length or frequency, and participants got true-false comprehension questions that they answered with high degree of accuracy. So the first thing we can look at here is what happens at the verb. We get hospital requested versus equipment requested. Um, and what we see here is a significant effect of noun phrase type in regression path duration. People have greater difficulty integrating hospital requested than equipment requested. And there's no similar difference in the unambiguous structure. Um, so this early difficulty with hospital requested might suggest that people are trying to activate the animate figurative sense of hospital, but that takes extra time. We can see what sort of interpretation people end up with by looking downstream in the sentence at the biphrase. So what I have here is the unambiguous versus ambiguous conditions. And if we look at first pass reading time on the biphrase, we get main effect of structure and, and no interaction. So in both the metonym and the inanimate control, there are longer first pass reading times on the biphrase in the ambiguous than the unambiguous condition. Um, once we then get to regression path duration, we see evidence of an interaction. There is a, a larger garden path effect for the metonym condition than the inanimate. In this spillover region with regression path duration, we again, we see no difference for the inanimates, but this prolonged difficulty with the metonyms trying to work out the, uh, the correct interpretation. And then we can also look at second pass reading time on the biphrase. And when we do that, there's again, nothing going on with the inanimates. They've resolved the, uh, the ambiguity, but they are still working to resolve the ambiguity in the metonym case. So in this first experiment, um, a sentence beginning with something like hospital requested seems to have prompted readers to access the figurative sense of the metonym. So we want something that can act as an agent. Um, this resulted in greater processing difficulty at the verb compared to our inanimate controls. This pattern of results is broadly consistent with what might be predicted by an indirect access model where people want to get to the figurative sense of that metonym, but it takes extra time. Once readers had assigned an agent role to the metonym, they experienced large garden path effects at the biphrase. These effects were larger and longer lasting than the garden path effects that we saw for the inanimate controls. The second experiment um, compared metonyms to animates. So we simply replaced our inanimate control word with an animate control word. So here we have specialist requested versus the specialist that was requested. So we wanna see in this experiment whether metonyms are actually patterning with animates um, by doing a head-to-head -head comparison. Um, again, the metonyms and the animate controls did not differ in length or frequency, and um, everything else was the same as in the first experiment. We can again look at what's happening at the verb. So when we get hospital requested versus specialist requested, um, we see early difficulty. People have trouble integrating hospital with that verb compared to an animate noun and no such difference in the unambiguous. What happens once people get to the biphrase? So in first pass reading time, we actually do not see an, a significant effect of structure, which is perhaps odd because in experiment one, we did find a whopping effect for the metonyms. Um, this, so this is a bit of a puzzle. Some might call this Kafka-esque, um, but whatever's happening with the metonym is not happening with the animates. Uh, once we get to regression path duration on the biphrase, we now have uh, robust effects of structure where people are garden path for both the metonyms and the animates to a similar magnitude, no hint of an interaction. In the spillover region, big garden path effects, no hint of an interaction. And the same goes for second pass reading time on the biphrase. People are experiencing garden path effects in both conditions, 
no hint of an interaction. So just to wrap up, um, when a, a place for institution metonym is appearing as the sentence subject that has to be integrated with an action verb, we're seeing that people have more difficulty for that when, they when we compare that to animate controls than inanimate controls. This pattern is consistent with what would be predicted under an indirect access model. Once people then assign the animate or figurative sense to that metonym, we see robust garden path effects when the by phrase disconfirms this interpretation. The magnitude of these effects is much larger than the inanimate controls, but is on par to what we're seeing with the animate controls. And so these results are consistent with the idea of a subject as agent principle that governs the processing of metonymy. And just to tie these results back to what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, it is important to consider the grammatical role of semantic expressions when we examine the relative ease or difficulty of processing. And finally, I just wanna thank the, uh, the wonderful team of undergraduate students here at the University of Richmond who assisted with data collection and thank you all for listening. Thank you, Matt. Um, that's excellent. Um, uh, so we are waiting for questions to come in. So uh, go ahead and type those in if you have questions for Matt. Um, as before, I had a question that was ready to go and then you answered it in minute 18. It was great. <laughs> it was very satisfying. Um, but I was wondering, um, given the effects that you showed in the parallels with the an 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 animate control, does that still speak in favor of the indirect access model or does it showing that people are just aware of the ambiguity that they face? Um, so the, the pattern that, that really argues in favor of something like an indirect access model is there at the verb, right? So hospital requested, in the case of specialist requested, it's an animate noun. It's very easy to integrate with a verb and to be the agent of the action. Uh, I think the pattern suggests that a, a metonym like hospital requested People are, are governed by a heuristic to want that to be an agent, but it takes extra time, uh, whether we compare that to an animate comparison or, or an inanimate comparison. And then the, whether we're talking about the metonym or the animate, they've, they've assigned it an agent role, and then that's disconfirmed at the biphrase, and the magnitude of those garden path effects are, are equivalent throughout. So they've gotten to the agent interpretation um, and they, they are working equally hard to resolve it in both of those conditions. Right, so if you do that, does that mean the, does that make it indirect or it shows that they can, you can get the animate interpretation of hospital and integrate that with your, your preference for what to do with the verb right away? Uh, so I think we're interpreting that they're, they're not getting the, the, and the figurative sense of hospital right away. They, they want it to be the agent of the action, but it's taking, it's taking longer. Um, so, I mean, the, the, piece of the, the piece of the results here that really speak to something like the indirect access model are just that initial integration of noun with verb. So whether hospital requests, whether we have an animate combining with a verb or uh, an inanimate combining with a verb, both of those are easier than when the metonym has to combine with a verb. It takes extra time to get that agent sense. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking to see if people got questions coming in. Uh, here we go. Okay, um, we have a question coming from Martin Pickering. Um, so Martin, can uh, someone unmute you so you can speak? Are you there, Martin? I'm mute. So mute. yes, this is really, really interesting. Thank you very much. That's a fascinating analysis of all of this. Um, I'm sort of trying to work out, I've got the, I mean, the, the, this, the sentence is ambig, the, the ambiguity is that there's this alternative reading where the, the hospital is gonna be the patient. And the question is, is the hospital more likely to be treated metonymically as the patient or literally as the, as the patient? And, and how does, how, I mean, obviously it's gonna be treated metonymically as the patient, but how does that, how does the analysis for the alternative reading relate? I mean, there will be a different type of competition going on, right? 
so am I making sense? Here? Yeah. Well, uh, you're asking when hospital has to be treated as the patient of the action. What what does that mean? Is that um, I mean, I, so the, the hospital that was requested by the doctor, I can imagine a doctor transferring a patient to a different hospital and requesting a certain hospital, requesting a certain hospital I mean, that, that would involve the, the place sense, the literal sense of the hospital. Um, I mean, when we, I think the important point is though, once we, when we have the unambiguous structure, the hospital that was requested by the doctor, people treat it just fine. Um, you know, it, it might be a little odd, but when the helpful that was is in there, people people don't really have trouble working out uh, that the hospital has to be the patient of the action. Um, right, so, so why aren't you considering the unambiguous agent condition? I mean, just the, the hospital has requested. So so that would be the, the alternative control, if you see what I mean, but it would be the control for the, for the agent. So, when the sentence is ambiguous, has, you mean why don't we have a condition where it's unambiguous, when it, where it's unambiguously figurative? No, I mean where it's unambiguously the the subject, that the agent, rather than yeah. I mean, we we could run something like that. I think at this point, I mean the the data. The fact that metonyms are patterning exactly with animates once you get to the biphrase suggests that they do really want hospital to be the agent of the verb, right? And right. no difference in the magnitude of the garden path effects. So, um, I mean, I can imagine follow-up experiments where the interpretation of the metonym in its figurative sense is correct. And we can see what people do with that. Um, we just haven't, we haven't directly examined that. Right. No, it's, it's very, it just seems to me you've got something like an old, an old style constraint satisfaction comp competition going on, except that in the one pair of cases, it's, it's a, um, one of the, the, al the alternative sense is mesonemic. Whereas in the other, in the, the control condition, the alternative sense is, is literal. But I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting, but it's got, it's got me quite confused as to thinking all the, all the things going on here. I see. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the, thank you for the comments. Okay. Well, I think that's what we have time for. So thank you again, Matt. Um, that was excellent. Great. <clears throat> Okay, so now you, you as, as we leave the sun setting beautifully behind Matt, uh, we move from a couple of hours south of me to a couple of hours north of me, I think. So we have Gareth Roberts, um, who is, as you can see, it looks like on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania. Maybe, maybe it seems like he's months away from us, though. It's beautiful fall foliage. It doesn't look like that right now. <laughs> no, I have to say. Um, well, I haven't actually seen it for a little while, so perhaps it does. But, uh... <laughs> That would be very strange. <laughs> <laughs> is Marta uh, Fedjikina, and they are going to be talking about social and community biases, jointly influence grammatical choices in learning, and take it away, please, Gareth. Sure. Uh, thank you. So, and thank you especially to uh, those of you um, joining us. Um, oh, there we are. Joining us from time zones uh, further east of me. Um, so I'm going to start with a historical event. Um, this uh, may or may not be um, actual uh, contemporary footage of the event. This is, of course, uh, the stabbing to death of uh, Julius Caesar in the Senate. And um, if my uh, Latin is up to scratch, um, a contemporary Roman might have described the event by saying, Brutus uh, Caesarum confodit, Brutus uh, stabbed Caesar. Which is Caesar stabbed, if you want to follow the uh, Latin word order. Now, of course, um, as you may know, other word orders were available in Latin. So the same Roman might have said Caesarum Brutus Confordic, Confordic Brutus Caesarum. And while um, these different uh, sentences may vary in the um, information structure, the emphasis they put on different um, constituents, um, it remains very clear who it was who did the stabbing and who it was who got stabbed. So um, the case endings on the Latin nouns um, keep that um, information clear. Caesar, well, we don't have um, 
this case morphology on the nouns, um, and instead we keep um, straight uh, who did what to whom by looking at uh, the word order, which is relatively fixed in English. And it's long been observed that uh, case and fixed constituent order tend to uh, trade off across languages. So if you have languages with relatively fixed word order, like English, tend to have less case. If you have languages like Latin or Russian with um, freer word order, you tend to get a bit more case. And I think we can think intuitively about, um, in terms of efficiency, about what might explain this. But I want to, one question that really raises the question, how does this get into the languages? How do the languages um, fall into the positions um, that they do in typology? And I want to present an account here um, in terms of um, effort and uncertainty. So what's really happening, I think, is, as we might expect, this is getting to languages via um, learning and people using the language. So um, extra morphology, when people use languages for, like case marking, costs at least a certain amount of effort. And this is something that um, language users might want to reduce. Uncertainty in communication, on the other hand, is also a problem. People um, ideally want other people to understand them. They want to understand what people are saying to them. They want to understand who did what to whom. So some solutions to um, these um, pressures acting on language might be to fix the constituent order and then you can save effort by doing away with case. Or you might want to um, utilize the um, advantages you can get from flexible constituent order in, uh, for example, multi different kinds of information structure, and then use um, case to identify um, the thematic roles. And we can also be strategic about case. So case might be conditioned on things like constituent order or animacy. Um, so with animate nouns, for instance, it might be a little less clear who's doing what to whom simply from context. So if you take an example like a language like Russian, um, masculine um, nouns take object case marking um, only when they're animate. Um, so how can we, oh, and this, um, these um, solutions represent, if you like, efficient trade-offs of effort and uncertainty, I'd like to argue. How can we test this? So one approach which um, Marsha and I are um, very keen on is to um, investigate this kind of question using miniature artificial languages, where participants are exposed to languages with different um, distributions of case and word order. And then uh, they produce sentences in the language. We get to look at the distribution of case and word order in those sentences and compare it to the input. And over a number of studies, um, Marsh has found a great deal of evidence of this kind of experiment um, supporting um, these, the claims on this uh, slide. But language doesn't exist in a vacuum. People are not simply using language um, purely exclusively to tell other people who did what to whom. Language also exists in a social context where people care about indicating um, who they affiliate themselves with, what their identity is who they're not affiliated with, things like that. People like to mark um, social meaning when they use language. And um, I'll give you an example of this uh, from English using the word whom, which I've used once or twice um, today already. So at one point, um, whom in English um, did this job of marking um, participant roles, thematic roles. Now I think it's right to say that in modern English, it's not needed for that, and it doesn't really reliably do that either. Rather, whom, it's been convincingly argued, is really marking not who did what to whom, but how the uh, speaker wants to be uh, seen as a kind of fancy person who uses words like uh, whom, or perhaps indicate their um, level of education or something like that. And we actually um, uh, published a study a couple of years ago where uh, we had an artificial language um, study where we manipulated kind of social biases acting on an artificial language and found that where there was a social bias in support of non-informative case like this, it, mod it reduced the loss of that form in the language. But let's, excuse me, let's uh, flip that for a moment. Let's consider an alternative situation where we have a form which is doing some informative work for us, 
but which is socially deprecated. So to take a form like y'all, or we can think of yous or yins, these are plural forms of you, which um, are quite useful to us, allow us to distinguish uh, plural from singular you, um, but which tend not to occur in more prestigious varieties, more prestigious registers of the language, because they, they're not socially favored, they tend to be socially deprecated. And this brings us to the question of the study I want to present today, which is, um, will a social bias lead participants to drop case, even when it's informative? So we're looking at the, this interaction between a social bias and the kind of pressures I was just talking about for effort reduction and um, reducing uncertainty. So this uh, brings us to the experiment. And I'd like you to imagine that you're a participant of this experiment. And as a participant, you're, you should imagine that you are on a voyage to a distant planet where you're on a trading mission um, to trade with these aliens here. Now on this planet, some of the aliens are blue and some of the aliens are orange. And the blue aliens always mark case. The orange aliens never mark case. Now I should make two points clear. First of all, the colors in the experiment were counterbalanced. Um, so for some participants, it was the blue aliens who never marked case for some participants. Um, the orange aliens who, who did mark case. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, blue aliens mark case. Second point is we didn't tell the participants about this explicitly in the instructions. This is something that was there in the data we exposed them to, um, but it's not something we ever told them um, explicitly. So participants had to learn a language, learn the aliens language, and the language looked something like this. Had uh, four nouns, two verbs, was used to refer to these four individuals at the top of the screen, and these two actions at the bottom of the screen. That these individuals would hug and kick each other in uh, different uh, combinations. And the grammar of the language looked like this. So, Word order was not reliable in indicating who was doing what to whom. So 50% of the time, all the aliens, regardless of their color, would use subject, object, verb, word order. 50% of the time, they would use object, subject, verb, word order. So you wouldn't be able to tell from the word order alone who was the object or the subject. The blue aliens, on the other hand, 100% of the time would mark the object with a case marker. The orange aliens would never do that. So give you a sense of language overall, in the data that was presented them, participants would see 50% SOV word order, 50% OSV word order, and 50% object case marking, which always um, coincided with uh, the aliens being blue. So the um, training worked like this. We had, first of all, participants were exposed to the nouns and tested on them. Then they were exposed to sentences. Then they were given comprehension tests where they were given a sentence and asked to choose the best matching video. Video would be reversed one way or the other, always be the same two individuals, the same action. Um, then we would expose them to the sentences once again. And then finally, we give them a production test where we give them a video and ask them to type in a sentence to, um, in the alien's language, describe who is doing what to whom. So I'll give you an example of the sentence exposure. And if you mean, um, I think want to, yeah. So uh, there we go. Sorry. Take what participants would see videos like this, and you may or may not be able to hear this. Participants would hear um, a sentence in language and also see it represented on screen. And they would also see an alien of a particular color on the video represented there. This was the alien speaker. And here's an example with blue aliens and an example of the case marker there. Vasa kufta di tegrun. So D there is marking the object and always reliably marked the object and only occurred uh, with these uh, blue aliens or whichever color was the um, case marking alien. So we manipulated the instructions we gave to participants. In the case bias condition, where we introduce a social bias in favor of the um, case use the aliens, we'd say we're especially keen to trade with the blue aliens. 
They seem to be on our side and they have important resources. We should try to impress these blue aliens in particular. In the no case bias condition, we said the same thing about the orange aliens. And in the no bias condition, we said we are keen to trade with the aliens. They seem to be on our side. They have important resources. We should try to impress them. So here we're using pretty much the same words, but we're not referring to either color of alien. And um, this is really just a um, control condition for comparison with the others. And just to be clear, oh, there were um, 20 participants per condition. And just to be uh, clear, as I said before, the uh, colors of the aliens are counterbalanced. So we're referring here to the case using aliens or case free aliens. Participants were never, the, the case was never referred to in the instructions for the participants, only the color of the aliens. So what did we expect to find? Well, based on earlier work, um, we expected that given that word order was not doing much work in, or any work in fact, in helping distinguish who was doing what to whom, to reduce, help to reduce uncertainty, we expected that in the no bias condition, we would see case retained in the language. For the case bias condition, where we're biasing participants towards the aliens using case, we anticipated we'd see the same thing, possibly with a boost to case. In the no case bias condition, on the other hand, we expected that even though case was useful in reducing uncertainty about meaning, we would actually see case decline in the uh, participants' um, own productions. And this is basically what we find. So we have the percentage of case in the participants' productions on the y-axis here. So for the case and the no bias, uh, this is the case bias condition, the no bias condition, we actually saw pretty much exactly the same thing. We, we did not see a difference here. We did not see a boost coming from um, the bias in favor of um, the case using aliens, which may be to do with um, the effort that's involved in producing case and people had to type a little bit extra. In the no case bias condition, on the other hand, as predicted, we saw this um, quite, um, quite substantial um, drop in the use of case. So um, in this condition, um, we have participants producing sentences where there's very little case, and there's a great deal more uncertainty in who's doing what to whom. Well, okay, maybe there's not. So the case use has dropped, but it could be that participants are compensating for this by um, doing something with a word order, for instance, um, to reduce the uncertainty in the sentences. So we um, took a measure of the average entropy of uh, the sentences um, to figure out whether or how much uncertainty there was in the census participants were producing. And it turns out in the case bias, the no case bias addition, we have relatively low entropy. It's the, um, the baseline entropy here. However, in the no case bias addition, we do not see um, the same kind of low entropy. So there's still quite a lot of uncertainty um, left in the language here. Participants are not doing anything to compensate for the loss of case. So you might think, well, okay, but participants maybe didn't really learn the language properly. Maybe they didn't um, become familiar enough with the, with the language to introduce the kind of changes that might be required to compensate for the loss of case. So we also thought that might be the case. And we replicated this no case bias condition um, with three days of training. So we had um, the same kind of session you saw before, but this was repeated once a day for three days. And we looked at the production results um, on the final day to compare with what you saw before. So here is a um, plot of percentage case again. You've seen the first three violins here. This is the um, case bias condition. This is no bias condition. This is the no case bias condition in the original experiment you've seen before in green. And then we have on the right, we have this pinky purple violin showing the um, percentage case in the no case long condition. Here as you can see people, participants had reduced the amount of case to a very similar amount. Not much a change in that respect. But had they now given longer to become used to the language, had they um, compensated more for the loss of case? So here are the results for entropy again. And here you see that actually there had been a change. So 
you've seen the first two violins before again, and this time here in this pinky purple violin showing the no case condition for this long, longer um, experiment, participants had indeed reverse, re reduced the entropy and the uncertainty in their sentences. It's actually um, significantly uh, not different from um, the uh, case use here, from, from the um, entropy here. So what were they doing? There were a couple of possibilities in fact. One possibility is that they were simply fixing word order. So if they had made the word order entirely reliable, that would help to disambiguate. So we can look at what participants did here in terms of the percentage of SOV word order here on the y-axis. And if we look here for the case bias condition, the no bias condition, we see that um, SOV um, word order was at kind of input levels by 50%. It had actually gone up with the um, case loss condition, but with the um, um, case, no case bias condition where participants had um, reduced use of case, but really we're not seeing a, a significant difference here. So another thing they could be doing would be uh, to condition the use of case on word order. So perhaps they use case with certain word orders and not with another word order. And that might, that would help to make the um, language um, reduce uncertainty in the language. And we do see some evidence of that. So if we're just looking, this is the percentage of case here, but broken down by word order, OSV on the top and SOV on the, on the bottom. Um, so as you can see here, there does seem to be something of a difference. It does look as if there's a difference here, um, much less um, case use with SOV word order here, except that, again, we don't find uh, significant results here. So what seems to be happening is we're seeing subtle effects, which when we analyze this data is not significant, but is contributing to the um, significant reduction of entropy we saw. So um, to conclude, we found that a social bias led people to drop informative case, case that was um, doing work for them, if you like, in communicating what they uh, wanted to communicate, to distinguish one meaning from another. And in that respect, they were saving the effort that would be taken in typing out the case ending. But at the same time, this was leading to greater media uncertainty. We found, however, that participants did respond to the loss of media uncertainty. They did compensate for case loss, um, but only after longer exposure to the language and only somewhat subtly. I mean, there are now some obvious um, next steps. One would be um, to um, iterate the experiments, so to form a diffusion chain where the output of one set of participants becomes the input for another set of participants. So we have this generational um, um, <clears throat> um, structure. And we may well find doing that, that um, we end up with language which is, um, shows much greater compensation for the loss of case. And also many of you may be thinking, well, okay, participants were producing sentences, but they weren't producing sentences for anyone. They were simply producing sentences in a certain sense into a void. So it could be that actually interact, actually bringing an interaction into the experiments where it actually matters for someone else's comprehension um, how much you reduce uncertainty might also um, boost the um, effect of compensation. We may end up with, we may even not get the same kind of level of um, loss of case in the first place. Um, and we are actively working on uh, both of these uh, follow-ups. Um, but in the meantime, um, thank you, um, everyone. Thank you in particular to Lucy Hall Hartley, who I think might be in the audience and who um, did a lot of the work of posting this um, study to Finding Five. Um, and thank you also to people in Finding Five. Um, thank you also to Andrew Watts, um, Vanessa Nieto, and several other members of uh, my lab at Penn, the Cultural Evolution Language Lab, who um, assisted with running this experiment. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth. That was great. Um, so we're going to be looking for questions to come in. Um, and uh, uh, I had one ready, um, but as in all the other talks, you came up with, with the answer to my burning question. Right <laughs> the end. Perfect. But we do have a question coming in, and we have one from Whitney Tabor. So Whitney, if you can be ready to ask your question live, um, so please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me, Gareth? Yes, I can. Awesome. So I'm just uh, interested in the 
way it was a little difficult to show the uncertainty reduction effect. You didn't get it at first, and but then you did the three-day training uh -huh. and you started showing those effects. And it just strikes me that sort of bound up in the nature of your paradigm is a symmetry breaking problem. That is, if the participants are going to do something to form a bias that helps them in the case, say, where there's no case marking, they, they, they might use word order or you're saying they could optionally use case marking in some cases, then they have to decide how to do that. They have yeah. to kind of come up with a way, okay, I'm going to do this one this way and this one the other way. And now in real life, that is something that has to happen, uh, has to be worked out between people who are talking. Here, I'm not quite sure I understand how it's working, but I'm wondering if the fact that they have to kind of make a decision like that in effect, they have to sort of go down a path in order to uh, choose a way of using that information is why it's so hard to get it or why it just takes a while for them to establish a system. Yeah, I think that, that this is a very good point. I mean, I think there could be a couple of different things going on here. Um, it could be to do with how um, familiar they are with the language and simply how to the extent to which they feel that they've mastered the language and are able to really do anything um, very much with it beyond trying to um, form sentences. And exactly this, they, the time it takes to, in some on some level, come up with a strategy to um, solve um, the problem. And I think you, you mentioned the word jointly there. I mean, in this experiment, we actually did not have, you know, to right. be clear, we did not have actual communication. This was participants simply um, producing sentences in response to a prompt, which I think does not um, entirely, you know, I, I think participants are still doing some of the things there. Participants still see, put it this way, participants, I think, in that context still seem to care about reducing uncertainty, still seem to care about producing sentences on some level that um, are not uninformative. Um, but I also think, yes, so once, if we were to introduce interaction, this might also play a part here in terms of solving this kind of problem. And a lot of the experiments I've done in the past have been interactive, and you do see different kinds of behavior where two people are working um, together on a problem, if you like, um, uh, uh, cooperatively um, trying to um, solve the problem. So on that level as well, we might see some interesting differences coming from interactive experiments. And I agree that, that might be a part of what's happening with longer training. Yeah, great. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I just think it's intriguing. In fact, if, if it turns out that in some sense, even an individual just working by themselves has to essentially go through the same process that they would if they were trying to do it interactively with somebody else. I don't know if that's the case here, but it just seems like your result raises this interesting idea. And it'd be nice to try and disentangle these um, things in fact. Thank yeah. you. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, the next question is from Amit Almor. So we're going from Connecticut to South Carolina, I think. Um, Amit, can you come on in? Um, can you hear me? Yes, yep. I can. Okay. Yeah, South Carolina it is. Uh, <clears throat> so very interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, and actually, while I was waiting for uh, my question that I typed to be able to ask the question that I typed, I came up with uh, another question. Uh, so studies with artificial toy languages are kind of, you know, there is a problem kind of generalizing them to language uh, more broadly. And in this case, even if we are to do that, I guess the generalization would be to a case of someone uh, a speaker, an adult speaker of a language trying to learn a second language. So this would be kind of the, the, the most um, kind of, uh, if we want to apply this to language, this would be the way to apply this. So one question that um, we might ask is what about the language that the subjects speak and it's kind of reliance on case or, or not relying on, on case and whether that might actually play a role and how would that uh, play with this. But the original, and I'll ask my second question now, uh, even though I realize it's a working memory load. Um, second question is, your focus is really on social effects, right? You, you kind of um, set your talk to really probe something that hasn't been looked at before, which is the social effect. But it seems to me that what you've done is you found a way, happens to be kind of sort of social with uh, two types of aliens, but you basically modulated attention during 
learning of this artificial language. And so it's not really so much the social and kind of the social things is important, but you know, you, you basically did something to manipulate attention. You could have done it by masking noise, any other way. So I wonder to what extent it's really kind of social in the sense that I think you primed us to expect. Great, thank you. Uh, so to answer your um, first question before I uh, forget it, um, so your first question was about the um, adult learners and the effective case in their um, native language. A really good question. Um, and I think, you know, to be fair, you know, I think this is, I think some of the things that interest me most about this um, question are not so much about the learning as about the use of the language in uh, certain contexts. And one of the I'm particularly interested in looking at what happens in interaction, the kind of social factors which do influence um, adult speakers. I think your point about um, case in participants L1 is very important. We d there, uh, there is actually uh, another study uh, by uh, Lucy um, Hall Hartley here, who's represented on the screen here, and Masha, um, which is concerned with that, where they um, conducted uh, related experiments um, on participants, I think they were from, um, if I remember, from Russia, and I forget the other countries. So several countries where the languages differ in the extent to which they use case. And they actually found that for, um, for this, at least, um, L1 did not have an effect. So we had the same kind of um, results. It was not exactly the same as this study, but it was a very related study on the loss of case um, in and word order, interaction with word order. Um, as to your second, I think in fact, this is um, being presented um, later um, on Saturday, I think, um, here at CUNY. Um, now, as your second question, very good, very good point about attention. It's something we worried about as well. So um, if, you may, if you recall, uh, there was a 2018 study, which was kind of doing the same thing, but put giving a social bias in favor of non-informative case. We kind of flipped it here and had a social bias against informative case. And for that experiment, um, we were concerned about this. So we introduced a fourth um, condition called a negative bias condition, where we, we drew attention to part to um, of participants towards one of the dialects, but we made it negative. So we said, we're reluctant to trade with the case use aliens. We don't think we can trust them. They have no important resources. We should be very wary of these case use aliens, Hitler. So we introduced the same level of attention, um, but it was negative. Um, and were this all about attention, we'd expect the participants in this condition to pattern with the positive bias towards the same aliens. We did not find that. In fact, they patterned exactly like the uh, no bias, as a no bias condition and the um, um, the uh, no case bias condition. They patterned exactly as if we had biased them against the other aliens or had not biased them at all. Uh, so we didn't include this to save um, cash. We didn't include this condition in the experiment I described today, but it's a very important um, point. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that we have uh, one more question here, and I'll ask this, and it's from Anu Reddy, but uh, they are uh, not confident in the internet connection. So I think you partly addressed this in the previous question, but Anu's version is a little more specific. So is if you had, if your participants were speakers of a language that has case marking, would you expect them to use more case marking in your study? I think so. Um, yeah, so again, I mean, there is some work uh, which we have done. Um, I mean, I was not involved in this study in particular, but I think you can see, as I said, I think you can see this study, if I remember rightly, on um, Sunday, um, which suggested that um, L1 does not have an effect here, at least in the um, way the experiments have, we've currently not have been set up. Um, there was an earlier study presented today where, um, which involved, um, for the same lab, which involved um, dependency length in artificial language and comparing Mandarin and English speak, uh, L1 speakers. And they did, they did find a, a difference. So I think there's a really interesting open question here about where and under what circumstances we expect L1 influence to occur in um, this kind of artificial language study. There's something I'm uh, quite interested in um, pursuing further and um, finding out more about. But at least for case use, we don't have evidence so far that that is something that carries over. And we do have some evidence that it might not carry over. And I'm not quite sure what to make or what kind of generalization could be made about where we could expect things to carry over from L1 and not. Uh, certainly point, I mean, I think for this kind of experiment where we're interested in kind of social bias, I don't think it matters too much. So I think, you know, even if we did find a certain amount of difference, we might 
hope to find the same kind of uh, modulation coming from um, the social manipulation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, Gareth. Um, thank you. Excellent. Okay, so um, we are uh, done for the day. This is the end of the first day of CUNY. A um, couple of reminders before you head off. Um, so um, uh, do you want to give the reminders, John? Uh, oh, <laughs> I wasn't going to give the reminders. Which ones are you thinking of? I was thinking vote early, vote often in the CUNY vote that Jennifer Arnold told us. Ah, about yes. Um, yes. And look out for emails from John, which will have all kinds of uh, exciting links that will make your day tomorrow perfect, starting with parallel sessions at 9 a.m. Eastern. Yes, that I was going to do the second of those. Yeah, vote early, vote often is, an, is another one. Definitely do that. And um, But yes, it's been a great day. I, I really think it's gone uh, quite well. The talks have been really interesting. So that makes everything. Um, so uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning with starting off with parallel sessions. And you will see an email from me uh, sent out early in the morning uh, giving you the links. So, okay, bye.